Now let's talk a little bit about some of the later Greek mathematicians. Here is a picture of Hypatia, of course an artist rendering of Hypatia, who is one of the mathematicians we're going to be discussing in this video. So first of all, maybe we should talk a little bit about uh, some of the politics and, and culture that was going on at the time. And uh, you probably should know that the Roman Empire had taken over the Greek world uh, by the time that we're going to be talking about in this video. During the 3rd and 2nd centuries BCE, Rome grew from a city-state in Italy to taking over the, this Italian peninsula and then finally going further. Uh, you can see in this particular um, uh, graphic here, this map, you can see that the green areas were part of the Roman Republic around 200 BC or, or uh, BCE. And then the expanded, it had expanded to include the uh, orange areas, including most of the, the main Greek peninsula there, uh, by about uh, 300 BCE, by about 100 BCE. So from about 200 to about 100, it expanded a lot over the uh, area here. And then during the first century BCE, Rome became an empire and it had conquered the entire Greek region. In 117 of the Common Era, the Roman Empire controlled this red area that you see in this bigger map here on the right. This is probably when it reached its sort of greatest extent. And if you look, this is a huge area and it includes the entire uh, area around the Mediterranean Sea and beyond that as far out as England out this this way uh, England Wales so forth out this way uh, the Iberian Peninsula here with what's present-day modern uh, you know Spain and Portugal all this along North Africa including Egypt and including Alexandria and including all of this area in here which was the main uh, Greek culture there okay so so let's talk so again by by the uh, the the first century BCE and certainly into the first century um, of the common era Rome had sort of taken over the Greek world so how about Roman mathematics well Romans certainly used practical mathematics for commerce travel engineering and architecture uh, agriculture and some other things but Romans were not particularly interested in pure mathematics as were the Greeks they were not as advanced mathematically as the Greeks and they did not because they didn't really value it so much they didn't do things like uh, bring in Greek tutors to tutor the the children of the rulers as say the Greek rulers did they didn't do things like establish great uh, centers of learning. However, Romans did let existing cultures continue as long as they were subservient to Rome. Uh, Romans were very advanced in some areas, but also very uh, behind in other areas compared to the other cultures. But in particular, they liked a lot of the Greek culture. So the Roman culture sort of absorbed a lot of the Greek culture. And so Greek mathematics continued under the Roman Empire, but it would probably still be more correct to call it Greek mathematics than Roman mathematics. Uh, there are very few uh, Roman uh, mathematicians uh, apart from the Greek mathematicians. So in particular, Alexandria, Egypt, uh, was made part of the Roman Empire in 31 uh, BCE, but it continued to be the intellectual center for mathematical thought, although it, it uh, got progressively less and less support from the state. When the Ptolemies were over uh, Egypt, then they supported uh, the, the museum and library at Alexandria. There, there was uh, stipends and so forth for the, uh, for the scholars who worked there. That sort of thing started eroding 
and becoming less and less over time. We should also mention a little bit the rise of Christianity. Without getting into this very much, Christianity began, began as a sect of Judaism in the first century of the Common Era, but then it quickly spread outside the Jewish culture. By the time the third century came along, they became a persecuted group in the Roman Empire, mainly because they refused to acknowledge the, uh, the emperor as divine. And, but by the time of Constantine, who was Roman emperor from 306 to 333 of the Common Era, uh, things had changed a bit. And he, uh, Constantine moved his capital to a city that he renamed Constantinople, formerly known as Byzantium and currently known as Istanbul. And he was, although he was a, uh, not a Christian most of his life, he did convert to Christianity. And Christianity became, around that time, became much more tolerated in the empire. Eventually, Greek philosophy, Roman culture, kind of mingled with Christianity, and this combination eventually became the dominant uh, European culture, the dominant influence on European culture for some time. Christianity became the state religion of the Roman Empire in 395 of the Common Era. So, uh, you know, in a space of about 400 years, Christianity went from basically not existing to being persecuted, to spreading, to becoming uh, the dominant state religion in the, in the Roman Empire. And so look against that backdrop, let's look at a couple of mathematicians from the later Greek period. Uh, Pappas is one I want to talk about just briefly. He was uh, in Alexandria, Egypt in the late 3rd and early 4th centuries of the Common Era from about 290 Common Era to 350. He was really one of the last of the significant Greek geometers. His synagogue or mathematical collection was written to expound on the entire field of Greek geometry, and it was really made, made to be read alongside the original work. So instead of like replacing them, this was kind of commentaries and, exp and expounding upon other works. You were expected to have these other works in hand, and he was trying to explain what they were saying a little bit. In them, he gives a description of analysis and synthesis approaches to mathematics. Uh, without going into too much detail, synthesis approach is basically you start with the axioms and the earlier results and you build up toward the proof. In the analysis uh, idea, you sort of start with the thing that you want to be true, you think is true, your conjecture, and sort of assuming that worked backwards in the hope that you could get back to something that is known and then have reversible steps that you can write your proof going forward. Um, He's probably most known nowadays as uh, doing some geometry that became the basis for modern day projective geometry. And he tried uh, somewhat unsuccessfully to revive classical geomet Greek geometry and to make it a more active area of research. But by this time, uh, it's already starting to die out, mostly because of that lack of support, again, from, from the government. And the last Greek mathematician I want to talk about is Hypatia, who we saw uh, the artist rendering of earlier. Uh, Hypatia was born in 370 Common Era and died in 415 of the Common Era. We know exactly what month she died in there in that time, so that is definitely an exact date. Uh, so late 4th to early 5th century of the Common Era, very early 5th century. And guess where? Alexandria, Egypt. And she has a couple of distinctions that we want to bring forward. First is she is the first woman in history whose contributions to mathematics were significant enough to be remembered uh, and have her remembered as being among the great mathematicians. Throughout history, uh, we'll see this at this time and later subsequent to this. Um, for much of history, women have been or were um, actively discouraged from doing mathematics, from learning mathematics, becoming educated into it, and certainly spending enough time on it to make significant contributions. Nevertheless, 
In spite of this, there have been some remarkable women who have done some amazing mathematics, and we'll be learning about some of them this semester as we go through. And the first of those is Hypatia. She was the daughter of a mathematician and philosopher, Theon of Alexandria, with whom she worked. Uh, some of the works that are credited to Theon, we now think Hypatia probably wrote significant portions of them. She eventually made her way to the head of the uh, Platonist school uh, in around 400 of the Common Era. There she lectured on Neoplatonism, philosophy there, and mathematics. And by all accounts, she was a very charismatic teacher. She had many students there, and uh, her work uh, on mathematics uh, definitely included some important commentaries on the works of other Greek mathematicians. Not a lot of really original work is known of hers, but she has some important uh, expositions and commentaries on earlier works. Among her students was a guy named Synesius of Cyrene, who later became Bishop of uh, Ptolemaeus. And there's some letters exist uh, between them, so we do have some contemporary uh, first, uh, you know, primary sources of uh, comments about Hypatia, and he he definitely um, uh, respected her and and uh, lifted her up as a as a great teacher. As I mentioned earlier, there was a general decline in the political support for scholarly work at Alexandria and other places under Roman rule. Alexandria being the uh, probably the last main holdout. In the early 400s, Hypatia became uh, targeted as being heretical. She was not a Christian, and the Christian uh, group there, uh, led by Cyril Bishop Alexandria, became very prominent. But there's also a guy named Orestes, who is a Roman prefect, and they got into a pretty bitter, bitter political conflict uh, Hypatia was a supporter and friend of Orestes, and uh, but in um, in some way, because of all this conflict and because bishop, uh, the bishop there uh, painting her as uh, as a heretic, uh, a Christian mob got worked up in the March of 415 and brutally killed Hypatia. So she came to a pretty violent. Uh, in there, and it's, it kind of really marks the death, not only of Hypatia, but really the end of over a millennia of remarkable Greek mathematics. So we can kind of point to her death as kind of the end of this remarkable period of, uh, of growth and expansion of ideas through Greek mathematics.